Our topic is achieving integrity in politics, and we have heard some definitions of integrity, but I'd just like to start by inviting you to comment or give your own definition of what you consider to be integrity in politics. Maybe we'll start with Mariano. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to hear somebody else's opinion. I guess now human systems, um, generally speaking, don't necessarily conform to the same sort of rigidity uh, that you do in physical systems. But at the same token, um, given the fact that we have uh, so some definition of social norms in terms of things that we expect, there's a general understanding that there are things that we ought to do and things that we shouldn't do. We have some general concepts of right and wrong. So from the point of view in terms of political integrity, uh, it is really being held to a higher standard about the things that we want to achieve in the society and the kinds of norms that need to be reflected in terms of the behavior and attitudes of a political party. So I hope I haven't said too much of a mouthful there. Uh, but in, in that context, and, and let's take for some, some for instances, um, <clears throat> integrity is also about what you do as distinct from what you say. In other words, it's how you act it out. So for example, if we say we stand for integrity in public affairs, then by definition, um, I expect the members of the political party, the people who hold office, to represent, to reflect um, those values in terms of what they do, as distinct from what they say. Now, we had a couple of activities, uh, uh, how shall we call it, uh, uh, events uh, within the course of the last year, for example, which reflect either one, the non-existence, or two, the fact that what is being said and what is done don't necessarily line up. And so what you really want is that, and, and I'll give you the specifics, right? For example, in the case of the issue of deposits, um, depositing money at a bank, um, there are certain banking rules you would expect, for example, declarations to be followed, and by definition, they would line up. So if you say that you're going to restand for something, then by definition, you ought to meet these rules, these standard tests. And if you have to make a declaration, then by definition, your declaration should be correct. Now, what happens if it isn't? Um, that clearly says there's a difference between actions and words and there's a lack of integrity in the process. How do you correct that? Well, you correct that with certain actions. The actions are, and it's presumed under the Westminster system, when one is compromised, you step down, you step away, or you allow for a certain investigative process to take place. Well, you can look at the events and see how they've worked out, and we can come to some conclusions that um, there's more in the mortar besides the pestle, and quite frankly, the actions and the integrity don't line up. So I'll just use that as an example. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. James? Mariano has just demonstrated that the concept cannot be defined. Look how long he has spoken. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. You know, one one can attempt to explain the concept in the context of what we would like. And what we would like is elevated behavior defined by principles. Now one can't go through the number of principles and the kind of principles that are needed. But we are sure that those principles speak to behaviors that we condemn as a matter of course because they go against the Agree. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've got to look to legislation to help us. We've got to look to some kind of consensus as to what are the higher forms of behavior that we need. And these things must be worked out with the people. They must not be imposed from on high, although we can start off with certain um, starting points, of course, we put in. We've got to trash out our understandings with the people and then push an agenda that is in consonance with what the people would like. I've been looking for a definition, by the way, on this website of uh, Transparency uh, International. It's not there. They can't define it either. So it's something that we have to work, to work out. And I don't know that, that as a nation we have had that kind of conversation, that reasoned conversation that results in ideas that we are willing to uh, put on a pedestal, so to speak, and aim towards in our behavior. The entire institutional framework 
that supports that process, that political process, is about ensuring representation. This is what Parliament is about, and this is why um, Winston talked about the importance of making that act born by Parliament, carried by Parliament, not through a minister. That's the subversion of, of political integrity in our system. To take something and hand it to a minister or a government behind the shield of a cabinet or a, a ministerial portfolio is to take away the integrity of that process. Right? Because Parliament is where the information is available to people. They get the chance to go to their representatives. If your political system and your parties are not representative of you, then you don't have any political integrity. And I think that is a challenge that faces Trinidad and Tobago. That is why people have to be going to the FIA to find out things, incur the cost, harass people, and so on, because the basic institution is not working. So it's a very, to me, it's a very simple. It's not a mystery. It is political integrity is a representation. Okay. So given that there, there can be debate about what it actually means in words, but we seem to be very clear when we have crossed the line. Yes? We seem to have greater clarity on, on what, is, what is wrong, what is not accepted, or what is not to be accepted. You know, what, what would you consider to be some of the more important areas in which we are crossing the line and we need to move back. There is no moving back. We have always been bad at integrity. <laughs> you know, people keep talking about there was no good old days. What we are is a society that is thrusting towards democracy. Mm -hmm. And we are functioning, trying to, we, we made this assumption that all those old colonial systems and the colonial education system and yes. civil service and so on, we can just put on a, put up a flag and have an anthem and figure we'll keep working. Well, they weren't designed for us. They were designed for control and containment. It's time we get on with the fact. What are the requirements of an independent people? And it is not to outsource your government and government to government arrangements, mm -hmm. right? It is to take, it's hard because it requires you know, re-engaging all these institutions. And what we are seeing now, all the crime and so this institutional collapse. So I don't talk about going back. Mm -hmm. going I talk forward. about how it's a really challenging, the longer you take, it's a, it's a hard it gets. How do we imagine a, a framework that serves the right of every respond, every individual under the constitution that we have given ourselves? and put the framework in place, the systems, the financial systems, the education system, the health system, definitely the representation system. How do we do that to achieve the objectives that we set ourselves of being free, responsible, happy, healthy, wholesome people? That is a challenge that has remained unmet and we are only being sidetracked into a lot of silliness because the equation with, with representation is not about the politicians, it is about the people. And we are still to turn the system upside down from maximum leadership where, where we represent politicians. Mm. Politicians don't represent us. We say, the leaders say, and we run with that story. We do not hold them accountable. So until, as a people, we accept the responsibility, and I'm, and I'm not pessimistic about that. I'm seeing more and more and more people, are, they're giving up on the, on the government systems. They do not, and I think if you did a poll now, I think all the polls are showing that um, public confidence in these institutions are all time low, and they're just saying, well, we gotta do it ourselves. Well, the point that you're making here also has a, a conflict when you talk about representation, because representation about representing interests. And the critical issue for systems and that systems must run is there must be procedures, there must be methodologies, and methodologies have to run that if I do X and I press this button, these are the consequences, this is what will take place. There's an article in the, in the press yesterday by um, Jessup, David Jessup, um, from the, um, the British Council, or the Caribbean Council in London. And what he's talking about, he's using an IADB study and talking about how citizens 
go through their daily lives in terms of receiving and getting government services. And one of the points that he made is across the region, across the Caribbean, Trinidad is no different in that regard, that um, the systems aren't producing and people have to keep going back. So the fundamental issue is that it takes too much time, it's long, it's cumbersome, mm -hmm. and it creates an opportunity, therefore, for you to subvert the system. So I want to say that critical to the issue of representation is also certain systems and procedures about things that we ought to expect to be done on a routine basis and that they will work and that they will function. So, for example, one of the critical, one of the easy examples is the application for a passport. Uh, we set up a system in about 2009 where you could actually get a passport in a day. Now, anybody going to the passport office, will, they'll tell you that it'll take you about three months to get an interview and then about another month or two after that before eventually the document is produced or whatever. Of course, there are different ways you could shortcut the system, especially if you know somebody. So the reality is <clears throat> that the systems and procedures that ought to be functioned to make life simple aren't. So that is not just simply about representation at the level of government, at the level of a minister. It is also about making it possible that we should, we should get certain types of um, services on a routine basis and we shouldn't have to press any button with a minister. Unfortunately, the systems that we have are actually finding that we have to go and talk to the minister in his office right, on the constituency day, if you could help me. And, and we know the issues are house, water connection, and, and health care. Three issues that you always go to talk in, how we could help me out with that. And the reality is that ought not to be at all. If we had proper systems which were running, then the minister wouldn't become so important. We wouldn't have to talk to the minister all the time. And that, because as far as he's concerned, he's doing representation. And as far as I'm concerned, he's actually um, restricting the business of just everyday life. You ought not to have to go to a minister for those issues. Well, I think, uh, I think we're saying the same thing. What you're talking about is the operationalization yes. of representation. Yes. Okay, but it is where you start and how do you design? It's like anything. What are the objectives? What are, where are you starting from and design the framework? That's what we haven't done. If I may, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. I would say that the way we practice politics is that the parties get our votes and then they turn their backs on the, the people who voted for them. We practice politics that way. We believe that the people we put in the cabinet, the parliament, have all the wisdom. They have all the knowledge and, and they don't need to continue consulting with us as they go along in a structured way. So we, we, we have a Senate that is not sufficient in terms of what interest groups, what publics it represents. We have a system where the cabinet is really the parliament because they have the majority. So we, we want a system where political integrity is assured by a connection between the people we put in government and the voices of the people who have voted. Sadly, after we have voted, we don't have voices. We have complaints. We have people complaining all the time in the way that I heard Mariano suggest. Uh, but we need to restructure our representation in, if we want to call it the Senate and we want to call it the lower house and so on, we need to restructure that. It must not happen by chance. It must not happen by personal discretion. This thing must be structured into the organs of government, right? And so when cabinet makes a decision, it must be reviewed as a matter of course by a Senate that is composed in a particular way and, 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 and puts the onus on government to persuade us that this is the best course of action. The way we practice politics suggests that we don't have that integrity just yet. And I heard President Winston Riley saying that he was saddened by the fact that he's alive today <laughs> to witness that we have not moved on, but we need to move on. Now, I don't know how many Winston seems to be a man over his in the seventies, somewhere around there. <laughs> and but, I don't know if we 
we're going to wait another what? 70 years before we restructure the organs of government to carry our will, to respect us, to respect the views we have, the knowledge we have, the aspirations. I don't know how long again, but I do know that we have to keep it going. I want to keep it going. I want to address the two points that Sunati raised and yourself and you have raised from the practical system. Since I um, could say that I was a minister and therefore I could have been one of those people in a sense were removed from the people. So let me just put it in context. Um, <clears throat> the business of government in a sense keeps you busy. So it is always difficult and we assume one of the fundamental assumptions that we're making is that the operational and organization systems are working. And the answer is that they aren't. And quite frankly, at the ministerial level, you're very far removed. You're at the top. You're very far removed from the structure of the system in terms of the responsibility change in terms of what takes place down on the bottom. Where is the system breaking down? Well, right, frankly, right down on the bottom. Where do people want help? With all of those little basic things that government is responsible for. So quite frankly, one of the things that we haven't done and we have made people responsible for getting is getting those basics, getting those institutional procedures and organizations, things, organizational issues, right and running so we understand how they work. We shouldn't have to see a minister for a bed in a hospital. And we ought not to have to see a minister for the allocation of a house. But if you look at it and you listen, people will come to you, as, as they have come to me when I was a minister, I've been waiting on a house for 30 years. I made so many applications. What's the allocation mechanism? How does it work? That hasn't changed. That's still there, right? And if you talk about the representative system, guess what? When they come to you and you are their representatives, what are they complaining about? Because you haven't helped me to get a house. You haven't helped me to get a bed in hospital. And that's why I'm going to vote you out of office, right? So the fundamental issues is about getting that organizational system running. And unfortunately, ministers are talking the way the system is meant to operate, um, ministers are talking about procedure. We're talk, sorry, we're talking about policy. Policy is down the road. All right? So, for example, to put it into context, um, let's talk about healthcare. So, we built a hospital, $1.5 billion, under a government, a government arrangement. We can't open it because we can't run it. For the fundamental issue, the decision being made up at the top here, and the critical issue for getting it running is making certain that all the organization methodologies in terms of the provision of finance, adequate personnel, adequate resources, adequate uh, uh, health care, ad adequate um, infrastructure facilities, adequate recurrent expenditure in terms of medicines and everything is not in position. So we have to deal with that. And one of the fundamental issues at government at the moment is we haven't spent enough time making certain that the nitty gritty of the system is working. And, and let me agree with you, you know, because that shows up in our, in our global competitiveness report all the time, that our institutions are weak. And when the institutions are weak, and when you weaken them even more, mm -hmm. you pave the road for corruption. Yes? So strength of the institutions is strength of the political integrity, if you like. Yes? And that's where we need to place our focus. And right now we have two pieces by of... Ways, um, what do you mean by when the institutions are weak? Which institutions do you have in mind? So all of our institutions. Pick one. You're generalizing. All of, the, all of our Pick institutions. One. So the report shows. Give me an example of one Crime every. Mean. So, well, crime would be our biggest failure. Let me say it like Sorry? that. Crime. Yes, crime and criminality would be our biggest no, failure. I'm not talking about yes? institutions. All of our public institutions. The, wow, well, I Mariano cannot, just gave I some examples. Be a sweeping. Uh, Dr. Mongo. No, perhaps you should tell us which one is working. I cannot be as sweeping as you have been. I am asking you to give me an example of an institution that is weak. Not crime. The integrity crime. Commission. All, all, the integrity Commission. All of our institutions. All the police of our complaints institutions. authority. All of our institutions. Are weak. <laughs> what kind of talk is that? Well, you've got to demonstrate what you mean by an institution being weak. So, and in fact, I am not I, so sure that that idea arose in what we were talking about so far. I am not saying that they are not weak. Yes. I haven't seen the argument that they are weak. Mm. And it seems to me that for me to engage with you, yes. you've got to give me an institution and then demonstrate it's weak yes. for, me, for me to engage. Well, okay. no. well um, can I just uh, interject? Do we want to go there, though, because yes. you are the, but let me the panelist, you are the moderator. <laughs> I, I, I happen not to share. I happen <laughs> not to share that view. Yes. 
I have not to go say. ahead to explain why. Uh, you every, follow? I am not arguing that point. Yes. I but am okay. saying if you are talking like that, the onus is on you to demonstrate. Yes. And but, I am not going to accept it simply because it can be spoken. Well, no, certainly. So let me just give you something, Maria, I was talking about. But, but let, me just, let me just clarify the point before we move on. Okay. Yes? So our global competitiveness report, every single year, right, since I have been here at this business school, every single year, the global competitiveness report shows that our weaknesses, our lack of competitiveness resides in the weaknesses of our institutions. You're still yes? very Yes, all of our, our systems, our port system, all of our, our the, the ability to get, get a, an identification card, to get identification documents, our ease of doing business, ah. all of those mechanisms are not working as they should. But I just want to come back to, to the procurement legislation and campaign finance legislation. Two pieces of legislation that has been promised, promised well, since by the end of, of, of 2019. In fact, we set up clocks marking the time to the end of 2019. We are now in 2020 and we are still hesitant and unclear whether these two pieces of legislation will be put into effect. And yet and we I'd can't like you, do without legislation. And we can't do without them. So I'd right. like so you to comment on that. This government, and other governments as well, but this government has passed, has managed to get legislation passed in relation to corruption. Yeah. Yes? So that we, we know, not only from the um, practice of Trinidad and Tobago, but other countries as well, we know that legislation is a critical thing. Yes. Right. So we have got some laws passed, new laws I understand, yes. or laws that have been adjusted. And then the question now is to operationalize them, but is to get them working, is to, is to get enforcement going. But yes. before we get to things like enforcement, we need to have something called education. And we need to have something called suasion. Education, if you look at the, the top seven countries, that Abdul, Dion Abdul, posted on the screen there, you will realize that coincidental with the fact that they are the first seven, they have the best education systems in the world. Huh? Singapore, Denmark, New Zealand. Yes? When you check their education <laughs> systems, they do not leave people behind. They make sure that people have a skill, even though it takes 100 years for them to get it. Everybody gets a skill. And they have a system, I'm saying. And everybody agrees, well, we can use the international uh, uh, benchmarks. Everybody agrees that they have the best systems of education. Yes. Now, we don't have that in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, we, we sometimes don't even participate in the, uh, the exams evaluation exercises that others participate in. So we need education. It is education in large measure that will make us Mariano not go to a minister and say, I want a car and I want a house. Education at the right levels. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say to you, people. you have to define education for me like how we have to define I don't know. I, <laughs> the people I know, the people I know who are significantly educated, don't go to governments for houses. They become independent in their thought. They become independent in their acquisition of the sources of wealth. Yes? That's what I know. So I'm saying to you, we, we have to look at education and see how many people we are alienating from year to year and from government to government. How many black African guys outside there are not moving on and are gravitating to violence as a way of getting even. That so, is it in that sense I'm talking about. And if you had a, a Senate that was properly constituted, I am sure that the results would be different from what we are witnessing today. I mean, I wholly agree with you, Dr. James. Um, certainly, we need to revamp our education system uh, and what takes place in our classrooms. And 
certainly we need constitutional reform. But these two, I, I just want to come back again to these two pieces of legislation and the importance of these two pieces of legislation to the protection of our future and to the achievement of a better future that we are quite capable of. Yes? So, New Zealand, just before you comment, just to give an example, the world is a free and open place now in this 21st century. We can learn from all kinds of countries. And this is a small country. Yes, you were far removed, but not so far removed because it's only 1.3 million people with possibly two, two degrees of separation between a minister and anybody on the ground. So, in New Zealand, they're very clear about what the rules are. They're very clear that their procurement system should give them great results, should be fair to all suppliers, should help them to get the right supplier, mm -hmm. should get the best deal for everybody, and they must play by the rules and get this. They say that, you know, well, expediency, we need to make decisions quickly. Expediency is important. Well, expediency is not a factor to be considered unless there is a real emergency. And your failure to plan is not an emergency. So how can we bring these two pieces of legislation to the fore? Well, I think what they have in New Zealand is also systems and procedures. One of the mm -hmm. things that also is not stated there, because we could talk about their procurement legislation, but they also have very clear legislation that addresses their state enterprises mm -hmm. and the rules of ministers, where ministers can get involved and ministers not get involved. And that's also a critical feature where we are with regard to the state enterprises. Uh, from a budget perspective, the total budget for Trinidad that we go last is about $53 billion. Of the $53 billion, $25 billion goes towards subsidies and transfers. Take out the social expenditure, is about $5 billion. You're talking about $20 billion is going to subsidy, is going to then the, the but take out social transfers, which is basically the uh, Ministry of Social Development, Community Development, and one or two other places. Um, and let's focus on that $20 billion going to the state enterprises and the issue of procurement rules and the issue of campaign finance reform. Because the fundamental issue then is that we are also talking about contracts. Mm -hmm. Now, $20 billion is a percentage of $53 billion is a, is a significant figure. Right. Right? And that has to speak to how, do we, how, are we, how tight are the systems. And I speak from this perspective as minister responsible for tightening up the system with regard to um, the state enterprises. <clears throat> So the 2011-2012 the version uh, essentially is built on work which would have been done in my time, um, published under the UNC, and it's a really race. It really doesn't matter who starts the work, it's how they're going to be informed. The question of making certain that boards are in position, the audit committees are in position, that they report the financial statements are on time, and also what they can do and what they may not do. One of the important things about this procurement legislation, which is, one, it, is what makes it cumbersome, and one of the reasons why politicians don't like it, because it requires that the budgets for the state enterprises and for the, and the national budget to be tightly intertwined. And for you have to work out from a contract perspective what you're going to publish, what is going to be on auction, who is going to procure it, how is going to procure it, and you have to have some specific rules. Mm -hmm. Now that immediately from a system or procedure point of view reduces the, the capacity or is attempted to reduce the capacity to interference. And that is what makes that system work, because there are rules, and the rules have to be followed, right? Without the intervention of somebody who has who is representing me, so I could I could have a little conversation with the minister, so he could right. find a way to sort this out, and the right person will get the contract. <clears throat> so that's why I guess from a system and procedure perspective, from a, I, I, you know, one of my critical issues is getting those systems to work. And they have to be policed, they have to be managed. One of the difficulties in the government system <clears throat> is that you will find, and say the ministry, essentially what the state enterprises section of the ministry, has a complement of staff. You will find that the majority of them are not in place. So that the actual follow-up of the mechanism is there, it's supposed to be followed up, but the actual follow-up mechanism can be actualized because we don't have the people who are going to do it on an ongoing basis. You have to hold people's hands. You have to set some, they talk about procurement, we talk about results. What is the purpose? How are we getting? And there must be some observable measures. So that we know that the, 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 the ministries are meant to report, at least annually, to parliament, 
to say what they have done, what are the exercises have done. When you have to tie that in with the procurement exercise, it makes the reporting stronger. It doesn't get buried in the budget. Most people can't read the 43 heads of expenditure and how this I line item went up because it doesn't, it doesn't add up to anything that happened that you could see. So really, it is really about making those things tighter and policing them and enforcing them. Now, that is where the action is. And unfortunately, that's not where we are strong. And that is what creates the opportunities and the incidences exactly. for all different kinds of things to take place. The difference between an organized country or those developed countries you talk about and, and us is not merely the system of education. It's the fact that they have systems of rules that work and that they follow. That's right. So, see, your comments? Well, we don't have to wait um, 40 years. No. This is an extremely fertile moment for the procurement legislation. The government cannot go to the election, the next election, without passing that. They have a manifesto. And this is, but the problem for the government, for all governments, no government has ever wanted procurement legislation that takes the power to decide who is getting a contract out of their hands. The senior public servants don't want it either. So this is the lovely dilemma. There's an election coming up. They know they have to bring it, but they don't really want it in the form. All that they've gone along and voted it before, they don't want it. Not, not only this government, every government. They give you a fig leaf. So, okay, we're gonna to have to do this, but let us take out section seven and 24. This is the moment for, for all of us to stand up and say, no way you're doing that. That has to be passed and do that. So this is the moment for public opinion. And this is what strengthens your democracy. They, we all have to say there is no way. We want that section seven stays there because the minute section seven comes out and section 24, you might as well forget it is not it's That's not right. what it was intended to serve. And this is the habit though. This is the habit of government that is central and retains all its power in its hand. They give you what are called institutions and, and they take away the power. If they give you a small budget, look at the PCA. The PCA probably has a long line of things, right? Does it have enough? Is it adequately staffed? Does it have the... the the, for, the, the, legal, the legal power to command certain people to come before it? Does it have the forensics? Does it have the staff? So it's, you t we allow ourselves to be fooled when governments offer us these things. And we say, okay, we have freedom of information, we have PCA, we have integrity commission, and we don't pay enough attention to why these things are not functional and we blame the people who are operating it and say, well, this one not doing the work. And the fact is, we've been, got a no job. And we cannot let that happen with procurement legislation. And campaign finance, this is why we cannot wait for the government to come with a draft bill to parliament. We need to be doing the work now to say, what do we want of political parties that are running for election? And I think that um, transparency is the ideal vehicle for summoning all the elements of civil society for us to come up with what this, we may draft something or you don't have to draft it, but you have to say, what are your non-negotiables? What is the direction this and the governor has to take its cue from that? Because you will know from the minute they present something against the fact of what you have discussed and you understand what you want, you will know whether it's short or not. So. You can't wait for the government to come with that and say, oh, we've given, we've, or probably hold it on, bring it at the time when it can go through. You know, we brought draft um, campaign finance report. So we come back to the point of an alert, engaged public as the foundation for a society that insists on strong institutions at the top of which are the people who implement right. to turn the thing upside down so that you are giving you are giving the directions to whatever is enacted in your name. And to follow through that, what you would require is disclosure. Of course, I mean, fundamental to that, which is the point you have about housing. People ought not to be having to wonder where they are in the system, but the system is closed because that's how you control power. You just get a call, well, no, your net number ain't come up here for a house. Why don't you have the right to say, open up all of those books, right. see where I am, see where that person was, when did that person apply? And because, Power is afraid of being held accountable. 
So open government, you know, many countries have already. Yeah, but done you have it. to be in, you have to be in, the public has to take the responsibility for knowing, and that is why you know you you, you talked about this the systems. People are confusing systems and institutions and all kinds of things. This system of education it rests on an institution in Finland and wherever you want to talk about, right? And these are things that come out. That's the education, the institution that, that creates that system is what is working. So when you ask uh, what institution, and I said to you, well, tell us which one is working. Because if your health system is not working, then the institutional framework for that is fine. Yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, no, that's uh, not, so that's no, but, but you, ha you, you didn't. Whenever I make a point, I will defend No, it. I thought you would have defended no, no, which no. one was actually working. <laughs> that's not the line. But I, that is not the main that's point. That's not the direction I wish to travel. Right. No. The responsibility. No. So if I may come authority in without responsibility. So yes, of course, of course, of well, course. I'd like you to come in on this. So the, we can't the, escape, escape yes. education. Yes. We can't escape good legislation. The laws must be good, and we can't escape the implementation of law. That's right. We are all talking about these things. Right? Yes. So I am suggesting that the system we have now is insufficient because the. Voices of the people are excluded. And the people themselves are not sufficiently conscious to let their voices so impact upon what government does that government is forced to change whatever directions the people don't like. So we go back to the question of dissent in our current system. Dissent must be structured. If you leave dissent to be loose and amorphous, we will hardly get the kinds of results that we want. And this is the case here in Trinidad and Tobago. We gripe and we are cantankerous and, you know, and we, we make noises, but the thing is not so organized as to push government to change the laws under which we operate. Yes. So we continue to say that the health system is poor, even though there are good aspects to it. Oh, yeah. Even though we have improve the facilities. We have more institutions. And I could get into the nitty gritty. There are good things happening, but they are not as good as they can be. Right. And they are not as good as they can be because people are lackadaisical. They are disconnected. They, are, they become almost cynical in the way they respond to. In fact, when you look at the way people vote in this country, more than two thirds Stay away from in the local, local government elections. In local government. Yes. Yep. But not in national in, government. In elections. the recent Tobago uh, PNM elections, if you assume that there were 10,000 PNM members. I don't assume that at all. Yeah, that's what they have been saying to me because nobody can give me the exact figures. Well, I want, to say, the the, I want to say the exact figures are fiction. Ah, probably. I am going by what I hear from the principals in the party. I want to say they don't Just know what they're talking about. Just under 10,000. I'm saying, and you get 4,000 people voting. Obviously, people are turned off. Those people that are turned off, you have to turn them back on. But you turn them back on by giving them the sense that their voices are going to be valued. And we are not going to continue spinning top in mud yes. forever because we are now insistent as civil society. One of the people I admire in this country for his insistence that he must get information that he wants to have, that government is trying to hide. One thing, another thing that he does is to crit critique laws that are being proposed while they are being proposed. He's critiquing the final version of Afro We need many more voices like Afro that's the point I'm making here. But we, will, we, we in this country, we prefer to complain and be cantankerous. And we don't know where we are going. So next 10 years, you bring me back here, Mr. Abdul. We're going to be saying the same thing. <laughs> right? When we really want change. Yes. And that is where we are. That is why the institutions don't run properly. Because you don't have structured voices to, to push government. Government must be there, you know. To push cabinet, cabinet must be there. Right. To do the right thing. The right thing is what the people want. So let's start off with the example you gave of a political party that only had 4,000 voters. Yes. Right? 
So by definition, then what's the definition of a member of the party? Sir. What's the definition of a member of the party? Their supporters. You mean that's a, that's no, I'm asking you. Discuss? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> because if so you want to get, sign up if the political the parties, party, and sometimes they have a card to indicate. I'm just that. taking off. I'm just taking off from where <clears throat> Sunati started off with regard to representative democracy, ah. right? And that they're representing organizations. So by definition, has to start inside the party. Yes. I did not know that the question of a member was argumentative. I didn't know well, that. a member, generally speaking, a citizen has to pay taxes, has to register, has to do certain things. You would figure that a member of a party would also pay membership dues and be involved in the voting rights and everything else that follows through from that. Right? So I'm, I'm talking about, if, we, if we're talking about the same sort of educated person who's going to have a voice in it and parties are going to be representing well, some of them are not that their, their members. Well, we accept that. But they know that they are members. <clears throat> but I'm saying, well, therefore, the that, is not that becomes part of the role of the party, correct? Yes. And therefore, part of the role of the party is the activism it demonstrates in terms of how it activates I its agree. members. I agree. Okay, so if the party doesn't do that at a very basic level, how do you expect them to do it at a national oh, no, level? Oh, no, 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 I'm in agreement with you there. Okay, good. There's good. No so I think, I think we are all in agreement, but perhaps saying things a little bit differently. <laughs> yeah. You know, that th these are in important fact, it's things. it's very alarming that these are the people who govern me. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's an alarming thing. You're not a member? And I might say, but James, you are, you are critiquing these things, but you are staying outside. <laughs> so that my role is not as valued as another role they wish to give me. And yet you must have people performing the role that I see myself performing right now. So, so getting back to the issue of, of in, what we started off with, with regard to integrity, yeah. because it really starts off with the membership and what the members expect, right? Because we can't expect to be depending, or, or sorry, defending a particular member of government if we're supposed to have certain objective rules, which we all have to believe, but I'm going to defend them because they're a member of my party. And when the other side does it, the other side is wrong. Right. But when my side does it, it's all right. <laughs> right? That does not meet the objective no, definition. Do so yeah. from the time we have that, and yeah. we have those kind of differences, and we have those kind of partisan positions, how are we going to be operating in national level when it comes that? to the legislation? That's right. How do we oppose that kind of thing? Right. <clears throat> well, I, I want to suggest that the, the, the voting public has been opposing it for quite some time, in fact, since 1986. And if we look at the, the, the benchmark systems, and in terms of compared to the rest of the Caribbean, very few governments since 1986 have been able to last more than one term. One more than one term. So it's quite clear that the, the, the public is not happy with what is taking place. Let's take that as a given. Right? So and I think that what has to happen, of course, is that for us to talk about this political integrity, for us talking about the, the legislation has to change. We have to they, they want to be satisfied that you are doing the right thing. As they instruct me. In right. other words, if you feel that the uh, people are dissatisfied, <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. then find out what their dissatisfactions are. Okay. And if they think that their voices on their own are mm -hmm. insufficient, inadequate, impotent, then they are probably seeing a group of people who have better strengths. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, and, and you know how that is resolved. It's resolved in elections. Right? So when they give me my vote in the elections, mm -hmm. the question is, do they leave me there to lick up the place, to mash down the place? Yes. Right. This, well, I am I'm saying, as a, as a hypothesis, uh -huh. that is what the Trinidad and Tobago electorate does. So, so let me just jump in and say, you know, we've been changing governments and, you know, getting more of the same. Getting, yes. a, you know, different but the same. So yes. nothing has changed. Education, as you quite rightly said, is important. What else can and we do? A particular kind of education. Yes. What else can we do? to let the public know what really is this integrity in politics? What does it look like? What should we hope for? What should we work for? We should work for, and Mariano was very clear, we should work for a system in where, where what you say is what you do. The rules apply to all without fail. We've heard the police commissioner say That's that. A massive the topic rules there. apply to all. But what else would we like to see to Let say that there example, is integrity in one politics? One example, if you permit me. Sure. Political parties that come into power govern the country partially to boards. Yeah? Mm -hmm. State enterprise boards among them. 
And what they do is that they elect or appoint people to such boards that are their agents to perpetrate what they want to have done. So they stack the board mm -hmm. in a particular kind of way. And not only that, mm -hmm. they take instructions from the one percenters as to who should be on those boards. Now, I am presenting these things as hypotheses. Mm -hmm. You may disagree with me. And the actual, the factuality of it is not what I am, not what I, what I am dealing with here. Assume that they are facts, or if they are not facts, they are hypotheses. So that if you have a big project coming up and you have to consider bids, you already have a majority on the boards that will do your bidding. Yes. And this will be repeated multiple times. Mm -hmm. And objective people will say, what's going on here? Obviously, the party is, is benefiting a certain kind of people and, it, and is excluding others. Now, that to me is corruption of the highest degree. Yes. The question yes. is, when you have procurement legislation, does it tackle something like that? Now, I haven't gone into the details of the law because one, there's a limit on one, how, what one does at one's time. Yes? There is a limit with what one does at one's time. And the question is, but there are other commentators, some of them with legal training, legal background, who will tell you yes. that this part of the legislation is not good. We must change it. And that's why we have an opposition, really, to resist what government is doing, to be noisy, yes. to make sure that we end up with the best that our intelligence can bring forward. But I gave you an example there. How yes. do you end something? like that. Yes. Good. You end it by doing, or by having third parties if you want, um, like the, the JCC and the seven bodies, for example, who have come out and stood out. In other words, civil society. Yes. The NGOs, right, who in a sense have to protect their interest. Yes. Right, because their interest is as valid as anybody else's. Right. right? And stand up and make the point um, with regard to section 7 and section 24. Right, but more importantly, precisely because of that as well, and this is the point that Afro Raymond makes all the time, is that uh, sunlight is the best form of disinfectant. That's the point that he makes all the time. It's a quotation from a judge. So just to add to that, and that perhaps is the benefit, both of the procurement legislation as well as of the, 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 the campaign finance. Mm -hmm. Find out and put on the table who is coughing up the money. Yes. So when the decisions are being made, we'll be able to point out exactly what's taking place. And the only way that we're going to get that transparency, done, yeah, and, we, and we not on transparency too, Transparency has its rule. That's, that's why we're we having hearing. that's why we're having this meeting today. Yeah. But on the other side, the point I'm making is that institutions need to stand up for those matters. <clears throat> there will be people inside there who will be conflicted as well. Yeah. But at the same token, unless you put it on the table where everybody could see it, we're always fighting in the dark because of those perpetrators that you talked about. But you what, use the word pejoratively what, what enables that to happen? The law yeah. must first say. That you guys have to be transparent. Every living bit that comes the law the follows the law That's follows right. voices. Huh? When voices are strong enough, the law will follow voices. Right. The That's law right. reflects what norms are. The and norms don't be come nice before if the voices. Those strong voices are structured into <clears throat> our parliament. Yeah. Well, all right, that's a separate rule. No, that's I've been saying that from the okay, beginning. Okay, I take your word. I take your okay. point, friend. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've had quite a spirited discussion. Yes, and I'd like to invite maybe just a couple questions from the audience, if you have any. So I, I welcome the views being expressed today. One thing is clear that both Winston and the panelists are saying that the issues now are so great that we have to stand up and be counted. And I have resolved as I listened that for the first time in my life, I'm going to make a placard and stand outside of Parliament on the day that government is taking, or the Minister of Finance is taking this, his proposal to, to Parliament for change. And I feel that this is something that others could consider rather than simply writing letters to the press yes. and, and so on. That, you know, get out there and let the government see the physically that, that, that we are against what they are doing 
and that we are responsible people who, who are taking the, the, the stance. So I've, I've committed myself today, and you could look out for me outside Parliament in February yeah. when <laughs> Minister Imbu takes the, the, the matter to, 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 to the legislators. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Second point now, let's talk about what the law can bring for us. Because it is not really a simple question of anybody being in handcuffs or going to prison. That is where some people's thinking is at. There are really positive things to come out of this. And I think it's part of the educational process colleagues talked about for us to understand that. So Mariano spoke about the fact that projects are going to be highlighted before. You have to be identified in a budgetary term. So there are no phantom projects. That's an important consideration. Okay. Secondly, we need to have a situation in which the state enterprises that we touched on, the state enterprises, we talked about it, the number of them and how they operate. The whole rationale for state enterprises is rooted in a central tenders board exemption from 1978. Because this new system is an overarching system where all procurement comes under the Office of Procurement Regulation. That rationale for, for state enterprises is, 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 is existentially challenged. You don't need them anymore because you're not getting any special benefit or any special break or any special thing. So there's an opportunity for us as citizens to reorganize our affairs in relationship to the changes tricked by the new procurement law. So we need to be cognizant of that as well. Okay? And we need to also understand it's an era of contract transparency. We're not going to get this by magic. We're going to get it by the... I'm very pleased that the private sector civil society group has made a statement. I understand JCC is coming up at one shortly. I'm also pleased to hear that. And we need to have pointed statements on this thing. We're not going to get this by chance because these people are holding on. The final point I want to make is that this forms part of what I call an arc of accountability. The PNM, I don't normally speak in party political terms, but I have to do so. The PNM has a particular relationship, a troubled relationship with these issues of accountability and governance. I see a former minister on the stage, but it is as it is, okay? And I'm going to sketch that arc in next week's article because what Mr. Colmimbert is doing, he's no outlier. It's not strange what Mr. Imbert is doing. It fits into an arc of things that they support and things that they try to shoot down. I leave it there for now. No questions. So we have another question. Yes, um, my question is simply to take away the power and influence of financiers should the taxpayers fund elections. Because we do indirectly because government take our money and give the financiers. Give it back. Via, give, they give it back multiple times via corruption. So should the taxpayers fund elections to take away the power of financiers? That is one. Uh, this one is directed to Dr. Winford James. You mentioned that the five top countries uh, in the CPI, uh, the educational system, etc. Uh, what about their history? Our history is one of colonialism, as, uh, you know, African slaves, indentured, uh, laborers come down here. In 1962, we got independence. We are a fairly young country, and uh, we need time to settle down. So uh, the history of the five top countries in the CPI, I don't know if they have similar history that will lead them to us here. I want to just offer a definition of integrity, political integrity. And my definition is simply upholding your oath of office without compromise. That is my simple definition of that. And um, my last point is that uh, our two leading political parties and the, no, the need for an alternative because we are citizens in uh, 19, maybe 81, when the winner got about 90 something thousand votes and didn't get a seat, all of we laugh. And when the COP got almost 150,000 votes and didn't get a seat, we laughed again. Um, don't you think that we should have done something about that to ensure that people 
when they get a certain amount of votes, 150,000 votes a party got and did not get a seat in parliament. I think, I think that is ridiculous. 90 something thousand votes in 1981 and did not get a voice in parliament. I think our overhaul of the politics of this country needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I'll ask the panelists to respond to the issue of whether or not we should finance our elections, the public should do Well, well many countries um, do, do some form of, of financing of elections, financing candidates. But let's put it this way. The, the current electoral mechanism requires a declaration from each political, so each representative or each person um, after the election that they, how much they have spent. The limit is $50,000. So 41 by 50 means that the, the best political campaign could, should cost about $2 million. Um, in reality, a political campaign costs anywhere between 50 and 100. So that declaration, in large measure, is false, and there are all different kinds of mechanisms to circumvent it. That's the reality. So that we have to come face to face with that in terms of how much money we're prepared to allow to be spent on an election to, to get X, Y, and Z, and how much you, you, you will put as part of the budget to let that happen as well. And we have to make some decisions on that. Um, but I think in the first instance, <clears throat> what we want is to ensure that the campaign contributions by different parties are known. I think that's a critical issue. That's the first point. And the first thing that has to get done, quite apart from talking about how much um, that the state has to get involved in. So I will put that on the table with regard to that particular issue. But I think it all comes back down at the end of the day also to what we stand for. I don't think there's any difference between the political parties, Afro, whether the PNM or UNC with regard to um, how they deal with the issue of procurement. So <clears throat> I don't, I'm not going to get down the road or, or, or allow it to pass that one is better than the other because that feeds into the prevailing mechanism that somebody is better because they will do X or they will do Y. And the answer is both are subject to the same um, temptations and unfortunately the same weaknesses in, in availing themselves of the temptation. So I, I make no distinction between any political party in that regard, anyone uh, where that is concerned. It's an insidious matter and it really, the only way that you can solve that is putting the rules on the table and making those systems and procedures, uh, putting them in position. And the other thing I want to put in, you could put in anything you want in the legislation the ministries at the moment do not have the operating mechanisms to make that act work. And if we want that act to perform, then by definition, all of those structures have to be reformed, including the national budgeting process, to make it happen. Talking about it and passing the decision is the easy part. It is the functional aspects that are difficult to implement. Very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the panel discussion. We've made some very important points, but most important is this call to action to ensure that we get the legislation off the ground and to ensure that we get our procurement system working as it should. To ensure as well that we get the campaign finance legislation on the table for consideration and that we eyeball that as it goes through the process. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. And let's give our panelists a big round of applause.